Danny the Champion of the World, Chapter 4. My Father's Deep Dark Secret. Here I am at the age of nine. This is a picture made just before all the excitement started, and I didn't have a worry in the world. You will learn as you get older, just as I learned that autumn, that no father is perfect. Grown-ups are complicated creatures full of quirks and secrets. Some have quirkier quirks and deeper secrets than others, but all of them, including one's own parents, have two or three private habits hidden up their sleeves that would probably make you gasp if you knew about them. The rest of this book is about a most private and secret habit my father had and about the strange adventures it led us both into. It all started on a Saturday evening. It was the first Saturday of September. Around six o'clock, my father and I had supper together in the caravan as usual. Then I went to bed. My father told me a fine story and kissed me goodnight. I fell asleep. For some reason, I woke up again during the night. I lay still listening for the sound of my father's breathing in the bunk above mine. I could hear nothing. He wasn't there. I was certain of that. This meant he had gone back to the workshop to finish a job. He often did that after he had tucked me in. I listened for the usual workshop sounds, the little clinking noises of metal against metal or the tap of a hammer. They always comforted me tremendously, those noises in the night, because they told me my father was close at hand. But on this night, no sound came from the workshop. The filling station was silent. I got out of my bunk and found a box of matches by the sink. I struck one and held it up to the funny old clock that hung on the wall above the kettle. It said 10 past 11. I went to the door of the caravan. Dad? I said softly. Dad, are you there? No answer. There was a small wooden platform outside the caravan door, about four feet above the ground. I stood on the platform and gazed around me. Dad? I called out. Where are you? Still no answer. In pajamas and bare feet, I went down the caravan steps and crossed over to the workshop. I switched on the light. The old car we had been working on through the day was still there, but not my father. I have already told you he did not have a car of his own. So there was no question of him having gone for a drive. He wouldn't have done that anyway. I was sure he would never willingly have left me alone in the filling station at night. In which case, I thought, he must have fainted, fainted suddenly from some awful illness or, or fallen down and banged his head. I would need a light if I was going to find him. I took the flashlight from the bench in the workshop. I looked in the office. I went around and searched behind the office and behind the workshop. I ran down the field to the laboratory. It was empty. Dad? I shouted into the darkness. Dad? Where are you? I ran back to the caravan. I shone the light into his bunk to make absolutely sure he wasn't there. He wasn't in his bunk. I stood in the dark caravan and for the first time in my life I felt a touch of panic. The filling station was a long way from the nearest farmhouse. I took the blanket from my bunk and put it around my shoulders. Then I went out to the caravan door and sat on the platform with my feet on the top step of the ladder. There was a new moon in the sky, and across the road the big meadow lay pale and deserted in the moonlight. The silence was deathly. I don't know how long I sat there. It may have been one hour. It could have been two but I never dozed off. I wanted to keep listening all the time. If I listened very carefully, I might hear something that would tell me where he was. Then, at last, from far away, I heard the faint tap, tap of footsteps on the road. The footsteps were coming closer. Tap, 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 tap. Was it him or somebody else? I sat still watching the road. I couldn't see very far along it. It faded away into a misty moonlight darkness. Tap, 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 came the footsteps. Then, out of the mist, a figure appeared. It was him. 
I jumped down the steps and ran onto the road to meet him. Danny, he cried, what on earth's the matter? I thought something awful had happened to you, I said. He took my hand in his and walked me back to the caravan in silence. Then he tucked me into my bunk. I'm so sorry, he said. I should never have done it. But you don't usually wake up, do you? Where did you go, Dad? You must be tired out. I'm not a bit tired. Couldn't we light the lamp for a little while? My father put a match to the wick of the lamp hanging from the ceiling, and the little yellow flame sprang up and filled the inside of the caravan with pale light. How about a hot drink? He said. Yes, please. He lit the kerosene burner and put the kettle on to boil. I've decided something, he said. I'm going to let you in on the deepest, darkest secret of my whole life. I was sitting up in my bunk watching my father. You asked me where I had been, he said. The truth is, I was up in Hazel's Wood. Hazel's Wood, I cried. That's miles away. Six miles and a half, my father said. I know, I shouldn't have gone, and I'm very, very sorry about it, but I had such a powerful yearning. His voice trailed away into nothingness. But why would you want to go all the way up to Hazel's wood? I asked. He spooned cocoa powder and sugar into two mugs, doing it very slowly and leveling each spoonful as though he were measuring medicine. Do you know what is meant by poaching? He asked. Poaching? Not really, no. It means going up into the woods in the dead of night and coming back with something for the pot. Poachers in other places poach all sorts of different things, but around here, it's always pheasants. You mean stealing them? I said, aghast. Oh, we don't look at it that way, my father said. Poaching is an art. A great poacher is a great artist. Is that what you were doing in Hazel's Wood, Dad? Poaching pheasants? I was practicing the art, he said. The art of poaching. I was shocked. My own father, a thief. This gentle, lovely man. I couldn't believe he would go creeping into the woods at night to pinch valuable birds belonging to somebody else. The kettle's boiling, I said. Ah, so it is. He poured the water into the mugs and brought mine over to me. Then he fetched his own and sat with it at the end of my bunk. Your granddad, he said, my own dad, was a magnificent and splendiferous poacher. It was he who taught me all about it. I caught the poaching fever from him when I was ten years old, and I've never lost it since. Mind you, in those days, just about every man in our village was out in the woods at night poaching pheasants. And they did it not only because they loved the sport, but because they needed food for their families. When I was a boy, times were bad for a lot of people in England. There was very little work to be had anywhere, and some families were literally starving. Yet a few miles away, in the rich man's wood, thousands of pheasants were being fed like kings twice a day. So can you blame my dad for going out occasionally and coming home with a, a bird or two for the family to eat? No, I said. Of course not. But we're not starving here, Dad. You've missed the point, Danny boy. You've missed the whole point. Poaching is such a fabulous and exciting sport that once you start doing it, it gets into your blood and you can't give it up. Just imagine, he said, leaping off the bunk and waving his mug in the air. Just imagine for a minute that you're all alone up there in the dark wood and the wood is full of keepers hiding behind the trees and the keepers have guns. Guns, I gasped. They don't have guns. All keepers have guns, Danny. It's for the vermin mostly, the foxes and the stoats and the weasels who go after the pheasants. But they'll always take a pot at a poacher too if they spot him. Dad, you're joking. Not at all. But they only do it from behind, only when you're trying to escape. They like to pepper you in the legs at about 50 yards. They can't do that, I cried. They could go to prison for shooting someone. 
You could go to prison for poaching, my father said. There was a glint and a sparkle in his eyes now that I had never seen before. Many's the night when I was a boy, Danny. I've gone into the kitchen and seen my old dad lying face downward on the table and mum standing over him digging the gunshot pellets out of his backside with a potato knife. It's not true, I said, starting to laugh. You don't believe me? Yes, I believe you. Toward the end, he was so covered in tiny little white scars, he looked exactly like it was snowing. I don't know why I'm laughing, I said. It's not funny. It's horrible. Poacher's bottom, they used to call it, my father said. And there wasn't a man in the whole village who didn't have a bit of it one way or another. But my dad was the champion. How's the cocoa? Fine, thank you. If you're hungry, we could have a midnight feast, he said. Could we, Dad? Of course. My father got out the bread box and the butter and cheese and started making sandwiches. Let me tell you about this phony pheasant shooting business, he said. First of all, it is practiced only by the rich. Only the very rich can afford to rear pheasants just for the fun of shooting them down when they grow up. These wealthy idiots spend huge sums of money every year buying baby pheasants from pheasant farms and rearing them in pens until they're big enough to be put out into the woods. In the woods, the young birds hang around like flocks of chickens. They're guarded by the keepers and fed twice a day on the best corn until they're so fat they can hardly fly. Then beaters are hired who walk through the woods clapping their hands and making as much noise as they can to drive the half-tame pheasants towards the half-baked men and their guns. After that, it's bang, 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 and down they come. Would you like strawberry jam on one of these? Yes, please, I said. One jam and one cheese. But, Dad... What? How do you actually catch the pheasants when you're poaching? Do you have a gun hidden away up there? A gun, he cried, disgusted. Real poachers don't shoot pheasants, Danny. Didn't you know that? You've got only to fire a, a cap pistol up in those woods and the keepers will be on you. Then how do you do it? Ah, my father said, and the eyelids drooped over the eyes, veiled and secretive. He spread the strawberry jam thickly on a piece of bread, taking his time. These things are big secrets, he said. Very big secrets indeed. But I reckon if my father could tell them to me, then maybe I can tell them to you. Would you like me to do that? Yes, I said. Tell me now. So ends chapter four, Danny the Champion of the World.